Hello students, this is Dr. K. Rajshekha. Uh, in this video, I would like to talk to you about physical anthropology part of your preparation for UPSC mains optional anthropology. So let's go through a few aspects of physical anthropology preparation that uh, you have to focus on. So first of all, I would like to tell you uh, that why people take anthropology. So you know that these probably these are the some reasons that you are already familiar about. Like uh, people know, prefer this because of these. This is considered to be one of the scoring optionals, right? In the recent times, you might have seen that. So people have scored around you know even 360, 362 marks have been seen in this. So definitely there is a good amount of scope to score in anthropology part. And second, we also notice that we have enough available resources where there are many books, study materials available in the market, and there are some videos, of course, some of them are made as promotional, some of them are actually part of other programs. And uh, there is also a good amount of analysis has been done on the trend of questions. Okay, so there are also some books that are available in the recent times in the market where they have provided as form of the question and answer structure, okay, which will discuss whether you know this is something that you need to consider, consider at what point of time okay otherwise this is the uh, possibilities that we have here and uh, predictability of questions because of the analysis of trend that had been done the questions are more or less can be predicted many students i have seen that they have certain amount of questions that they're working on some uh, previous toppers also mentioned that they probably have worked on 200 250 questions or so and they prepared more or less questions are actually are repetitive in the exam that is also making it bit more attractive to many students. So next, static nature. Also, uh, relatively compared to the other subjects, other optionals, this is more static. We also have a very small part of the uh, dynamic portion in this, like if you talk about tribals or if you talk about even in the physical anthropology part, like in epidemiological anthropology, the COVID-19 situation that we are going through, and can come under this. So, and biotechnological new interventions that we are hearing like vaccine developments. So there is definitely some amount of dynamic portion, but compared to the other optional, this is much less. And more than anything, it is really interesting to read because you have to live with it for at least, even if you are lucky to you know, finish everything in terms of reading, definitely uh, you have to spend at least six months of time with it, right? So in that case, if it is not interesting to you, I don't think you'll be able to digest it and continue to read it, right? So in that sense, it has to be interesting. And this is anthropology is about studying humans. And it is really interesting to know more about us and some aspects of it, which you might have not thought about. Even I believe if you become an administrator, the perspective that you develop as part of reading anthropology, understanding anthropology, will definitely change the way you deal with people, okay? So that is, I think, something very, very important that we have to understand. So these are the reasons why people we have seen uh, picking anthropology. So I'm sure this is for even people without background in biology, because I know one big area, big concern that people have is physical anthropology. If you can deal with physical anthropology part, many say that it is easier to read and understand socio-cultural anthropology part. Okay, that is indeed true, but you don't have to worry too much about it in this video. I'm going to tell you how is the syllabus, what topics you have to read, to what level of depth we need in these topics based on the questions that are asked in the past. So we have, of course, physical anthropology and socio-cultural anthropology as part of this anthropology and archaeology also you have to read as part of it, which is a little bit tricky in terms of information and the things that you have to remember. But otherwise, this is doable and this is a small chunk of it actually. So, in this video, as I mentioned to you, my focus is on physical anthropology, the topic, the area that I teach in anthropology part in Fenman with uh, Venkat Mohan sir. So, what is physical anthropology? So, physical anthropology is also known as biological anthropology. It is also known as biological anthropology because in the past, uh, based on the differences, anatomical differences or physical differences, especially in the skeletal remains of the body, uh, they were they were seeing the human development in the context of that. In that sense, they called it physical, but later it became biological anthropology. Okay, so both are synonymously used. 
So what is physical anthropology or biological anthropology and what does it cover? So this is a study of human origins, evolution, variation, adaptation, etc. So meaning here we study about how humans have evolved, okay, from more simpler organisms to this, this complex organisms that we are seeing today. And also in the process, how closely are we related to the, the primates that we look more or less similar to, right? So evolutionary part and origins and variation. We find enough variation among humans. One, depending on the geographical regions. So something to do with the environment. So what is the connection and correlation here? And when people are living in different regions, either they're living in cold, hot climates or high altitude regions, how do they adapt to it? What type of changes do happen in them? So these are all the various aspects of human development that we see in physical anthropology. So it is study of humans, but in the context of biological aspects, what we are built with, what we are capable of, what type of plasticity that we have, you know, in our bodies, all these aspects we, we cover as part of physical anthropology. Okay, so we study them as part of primatology, a study of primates. Many people ask this question, why primate? This is anthropology related to humans. Why should we study about primates? Because these are our predecessors from whom human species have evolved. So there are good, clear indications and evidences that humans have evolved from primates. And we share a lot of features with these primates, right? So we have a dedicated portion of a unit actually where we talk about primates, primates characteristics, and we do study comparative analysis of human characteristics and primate characteristics. Okay, and also we have paleoanthropology. Nothing but this is study of fossils, our ancestral species. Okay, compared to the modern humans, those human species that have existed before us, how different are they? And how similar are they to the primates? Basically figuring out the order of events here. For that, we utilize fossils, fossil evidences. Also bioarchaeology deals with, you know, analyzing the biological components like skeletal systems in archaeology because there you have to dig through the you know, soil for looking for those evidences that got buried over a period of time. Okay, this is one component of anthropology, physical anthropology, and then we have human biology. So where we talk about few of the core ideas in biology, especially the concepts of genetics that we look into. Okay, and then we also have molecular anthropology on which recent times we have been seeing questions where at the level of molecules, what type of evidences can we acquire? And how are these evidences used, which are studied as part of applied anthropology or applications of anthropology? And then we also have as part of the applications of anthropology, forensic anthropology that we have. So these are various dimensions. There are many, a uh, few other dimensions as well, like ecological anthropology, epidemiological anthropology, <clears throat> nutritional anthropology. So we have a couple of other areas as well. So this is what we study as part of physical or biological anthropology. Now, I would like you to ask this question because I know usually uh, when you choose optional like this, uh, you ask this question, so what type of strategy do I need for this? And what type of topics are covered as part of this, this area, which some students without biological background find difficulty in, okay? So first of all, I think it doesn't matter what optional it is, right? you pick the optional by reading the syllabus and see if that is actually appealing to you and see if that is that you get a sense that it is doable to you. okay collect more data more information speak to a few people if you are confused about this mentors as well as students who have uh, taken it and fortunately these days in this era of uh, advanced communication technology we have several students who established their blogs provided some insight into this information but I'm sure this technology also put us a little bit of uh, in dilemma, actually more dilemma than people used to have before. Uh, the reason is that we actually have more information than what we can handle, it creates more confusion. But yes, you have to speak to people and you have to be uh, understand what are your uh, strengths and see if you can find that interest in the subject like this. And if so, take it up, doesn't matter. I think most of the things that we do in our life our experiments but of course it also costs time so we have to be careful when making the decision right so first and foremost thing is to look into the syllabus and 
understand the sub parts of the syllabus as well. It's not just reading the titles. So what I'm going to do spend most of the time today is actually going through, of course, this is not going to be a very extensive version of it, but briefly, what do we have to cover? What topics that we have to deal with? And I'll also uh, touch on what are the complexities of that information that we are going to deal with. Towards the end, I will also tell you like what type of sources that we, uh, we can use to deal with this information, right? So first and foremost thing is to understand the syllabus. I'll briefly give you an overview about the syllabus as part of how to study physical anthropology, okay? Right. So this is a syllabus I copied from the uh, website, uh, UPSA syllabus uh, PDF. Okay, so first of all, you will begin in, this is part of paper one, and uh, we begin uh, understanding what is anthropology? What is the meaning of anthropology? Let we begin understanding that meaning of anthropology, and then scope of anthropology, and development, so historical aspects related to anthropology, and then connection between anthropology and the other fields, like social sciences, life sciences, medical sciences. You would develop this idea anyway once you finish reading the other topics, but to begin with, to have an introduction and a little bit of connection to be made in your head before you even build more information and collect more information on this. So this is something that you have to give a brief read. And normally uh, we, we refer or we recommend people to you know go through books like Ember and Ember because Ember and Ember gives a nice overview about what is anthropology is all about okay so that is something that where you should probably start reading even before choosing your optional in and give it a re and see how it feels okay so those aspects uh, we can indeed uh, look into or talk about and then um, so branches of anthropology you anyway study them because we already talked about it biological socio cultural archaeological anthropology and the linguistic anthropology so we study about these four areas so my focus will be on the biological anthropology part. Okay, so we begin actual uh, process of understanding physical anthropology with unit 1.4, where human evolution and, uh, and how humans actually evolved from the other existing species is what to discuss. Okay, in this, what do we cover here? We talk about theories, various theories of evolution. Okay. And Darwin is a reference point for us. So before Darwin, so before Darwin, so pre-Darwinian theories, post-Darwin, after Darwin time. So these theories you have to briefly understand. In the exams also we have seen, they they are frequently asking about these theories. Okay, and then once you finish talking about that, there are few terms that you have to understand related to uh, evolution. So few terms like uh, you know um, what do we call adaptive variation, mosaic evolution. And certain rules, certain predictions, Dolo's rule, Cope's rule, Gauss rule, these type of components are there. Again, this information is difficult to find. Not many books actually discuss, even though they discuss evolution at huge length. But few books like Telugu Academy books, they actually have covered because they have written uh, by keeping in the mind of the requirements of UPSC exam and UPSC syllabus. Okay, so once you cover these aspects of evolution, understand the theories, how theories indeed evolved over a period of time from the time where we had no understanding and no acceptance of that whether we are different or do we all have fixed you know features or characteristics in us so it took enough time for us so this gives us a as a feeling that uh, how our knowledge and especially science has convinced us over a period of time about uh, the reality of what these humans are after that, there are also specific topic that is factors in human evolution, both biological, cultural factors is also something that usually appears in the exam. So this is definitely a very important chapter. And also to begin with, I recommend students to read, start with this chapter itself. Okay. Understanding evolution and uh, in the 1.4. Then comes the characteristics of primates, unit 1.5. This is primatology I was briefly mentioning to you. This is all about studying primates. And I already told you why we have to study about primates. They are very close relatives to us. So it gives us an idea about what changed in them to, to evolve into us, okay? So here there are, of course, some uh, factual data that we have to go through like primate taxonomy and uh, adaptations of primates, whether they live on the trees, they live on the you know, plains, and uh, what type of things have to go, have to change to become 
uh, into humans. Okay, some classification that we have to study here, and we have to study about the living primates and also fossil primates that we have to study here. A brief classification is needed, like tertiary, quaternary primates that we talk about here. Okay, so based on the classification of timing when they existed on Earth. Okay, and also a few factors are covered here, like skeletal changes due to erect posture and its implications, meaning when people started, you know, standing up, what factors led to them. So they tie back into biological and cultural factors into human evolution. And uh, when people started standing up, what other parts of the body has to change? What other events in human life has to change? Okay, those are all the things that we study. We see the connections. We see the logic that is all about the sciences. Compared to the other part of the anthropology, that is sociocultural anthropology, here we go with the logic, we go with the reason. Okay, so we need slightly different mindset when you are reading this part. But yes, we all have to accept that the whole biological anthropology that we are studying here, not to become experts in genetics or these parts, but to see the human evolution and human development in terms of biology, in terms of biological aspects. Okay, right. Next, we have unit 1.6 where we get into details about the quaternary fossils. We get into the quaternary fossils part here. So, here we have clear division into events or orders starting from the less evolved to the more evolved. Okay, those Australopithecines, okay, fossils that were found, these are all fossils. So, they don't, these species don't exist, but we have evidences of them. Okay. So Australopithecines and we have Homo erectus and few selected uh, Homo erectus fossils I talked about here, Neanderthals and Rhodesian man and then finally Homo sapiens and more primitive than the modern humans like Cro-Magnon, Grimaldi, Chancellery. So these type of things that we have to go through, this is one complex and difficult area where people do have a little bit of struggle if you don't have biological uh, background in biology. This terminology is a little complex here, but don't worry, all this can be done with practice. So I don't think any optional is, is easy, right? So this is one of the difficulty that students with no bio background has to face, but still do it, okay? Right, so next, once we finish talking about evolution primatology in unit 1.7, we have a fundamental unit, a unit that actually deals with few aspects of, you know, uh, few aspects of the, uh, biology basic basics of biology so here biological basis of life study about cell so fundamental unit of life and the dna this is the uh, information genetic information that is carried on from generations to generation how does it replicate and how this genetic instructions stored in dna are converted into proteins these are called working molecules because what we receive from our parents is the instructions but these have to be converted into molecules that give us the features that we are seeing okay and run the show and then genes so fundamental units of dna and mutations that are changes in the in the in the dna sorry chromosomes cell division so these covers the various aspects of basics related to human genetics part that you need and i have seen some students actually mentioning that I have not covered this part because questions don't usually appear in the exam. And uh, I don't agree with that because yes, questions are not appearing from this, but think about this aspect. If you have to study the abnormalities in chromosomes, can you do that without understanding what chromosomes are, what are the structures, where do they come from, how do they divide? Is it possible? It's like you know leaving the bottom layer because you're not planning to live there, but you want to build a big mansion. So this is a very, very fundamental. It doesn't take too much of time. Maybe you spend, you know, a good one day of time going through the concepts here because there are many books, lot of sources, good videos that you can go through if you carefully choose and then make that foundation and build your understanding of human genetics on this. Okay. So that is that one day is worth because I'm sure you don't realize, but as a background with uh, genetics background where I myself struggled to understand the concepts of genetics before uh, you know cracking and understanding the concepts related to that uh, yes it is difficult but this is essential so then after 1.7 then we have uh, archaeological concepts begin there basics of archaeological in 1.8 1.9 and then socio-cultural anthropology theories those are part of it 
10 at unit, beginning at the unit 9, we again start studying physical anthropology. So this is where we begin understanding the human genetics part. Okay, this is a core idea that we need to understand. There are several subunits of this in point two, in point three, in point four, in point five. They are covered as part of human genetics. Okay, so what do we study under human genetics? So this is specifically studying the genetic components, behavior, maintenance, regulation, all these aspects related to human DNA and their elements come under human genetics. Okay, because genetics is study of inheritance, correct? So those components that deal with this is what we talk about. But here the focus is on the methods and applications. Okay, specific methods and applications. Like one thing that we have to remember here, unlike study of plants or animals, studying humans is difficult. It's a challenge. Why? Because humans have uh, certain complexities. It is not easy to control them. And we have uh, longer generation time. So because of that, what happens? We have to find some methods to give us little insight into either studying the disease, you know, inheritance in a family or studying the variations that we have within us and what's controlling those characteristics in us. Okay. We need some methods. We need some tools. Those are the tools that we study here. So that is why they say methods for study of genetic principles in man and family. Actually, once the question was asked like this directly, briefly discuss the methods used in studying the humans so some questions are picked up directly from the syllabus as it is that is one thing that why where people prefer this because not much is hidden okay so what type of techniques like we have something called pedigree analysis this is building constructing family trees studying the connection studying the inheritance pattern of a disease how disease is running in the families can we pick up something by just collecting data from the existing people and the historical aspects of their family and then we uh, related to that, we also talk about cytogenetic methods. This is cyto means cell, cell genetics. So what happens here? Here you are actually analyzing the genetic components of the cell, like chromosomes, how they are organized. Are, is there any abnormality in the chromosomes can be studied here? Okay. And then karyotyping analysis, chromosome analysis or karyotyping analysis comes under cytogenetics as well. Karyotyping is also arrangement of chromosomes and seeing if there are any abnormalities that you can pick up by looking at it okay so after that uh, we have some methods where we can analyze biochemical components of humans meaning analyzing proteins analyzing rna analyzing dna dna amount dna here we don't go morphologically but we go by uh, the changes that happen in their biochemistry meaning their structure their individual components like nucleotides, what make up the DNA. So those components, proteins especially, because some abnormalities happen. So where mutations in the DNA result in abnormal proteins, maybe abnormal version of the protein or abnormal amounts of the proteins. Either ways, if you're analyzing them to understand what a person is going through, for example, metabolic syndromes that we have, where some people actually have accumulation of some biochemicals in their body, some metabolites in their body. So there we have to use biochemical methods. So this is again looking into the humans by using the methodology to see what's going wrong. Can we treat it? Can we control it? So those aspects come under bio, biochemical methods. Then we have what is called immunological methods. Immunology, you know very well and nowadays I think because of COVID-19 we hear quite a bit about immunological concepts. And immunology means our defense system. So what type of immunological methods that you use? What is it? I've seen once the question came, what is immunogenetics? So genetic components that control immune system function. It could be antibodies, antigen, antigens. There's huge amount of diversity and that we learn in immunogenetics and there are certain immunological methods. What are those immunological methods? Again, something that you're coming across these days, it could be diagnostic methods like ELISA, RT-PCR type of methods. Of course, RT-PCR is a type of molecular tool, molecular genetics tool, because you are analyzing their DNA, right? So those type of methods can also come under immunological methods because you are here identifying an infection, you are understanding how your body is responding to infection, all those things come under immunological methods. Where there is some amount of overlap between immuno immunological methods and biochemical methods, because in biochemistry as well, we deal with proteins, 
the same proteins, antigens, antibodies act like them. So they also are part of immunological methods. So if you really understand the connection here, even with few examples, you can answer both the questions of biochemical methods and immunological methods, provided you know how they are linked. Okay, that is where I have seen in some batches with students where they, they were missing that link. They were they could not understand. Okay, that is where you need some experts' advice and uh, interpretation and how they are connected. And this is also one area where we don't have too much of information available in the resources that you have to you have to pick up. Okay, like then DNA technology, which is very popular, DNA technology and recombinant DNA technologies. So once you understand what is DNA, once you understand what are genes, how do you repair them? And how do you actually work with them forming new combinations becomes easy, right? So that is why 1.7 is a requirement as I was mentioning to you. And then, so you, you work on genetic engineering, recombinant DNA technology, how hormones can be made in the laboratories to meet the demands of the people because over a period of time, we are prone to more and more issues like diabetes. We are now understanding more about few proteins are missing in us leading to abnormal conditions. Can we make them in the laboratories um, using the understanding that we have in modification of DNA? Okay, so these aspects, this is where new things can be added. During the COVID-19 time, there are many technologies that we have heard about here. Vaccine development is frequently heard. This is an application of DNA technology for human battery. Okay, so these aspects are covered as part of unit 9.1. And then we have 9.2, which is Mendelian genetics. Okay, so here Mendelian genetics is discussed because Mendelian genetics what provides the core concept of genetic principles of humans. So Mendel, Gregor Mendel, who provided us the idea about how characteristics are inheriting. So although he worked in plants, but they are also related to humans. They can explain, of course, not everything related to human inheritance but the core concepts still hold true okay so mendelian genetics in man family study okay so how is it used one question had come how mendelian genetics is applicable to the human populations so we have to understand what mendel has said about the plants and how it can be related to the humans okay so along with that so we have a single factor that is meaning characteristics that are controlled by single gene multi-factor are polygenic, there is some correlation here, overlap here. Polygenic means many genes, multi-factor means multiple factors. Although Mendel called gene as a factor, there are two meanings to this, okay? So, but you have to understand the difference between polygenic, multi-factor analysis, multi-factor characteristics, okay? And then um, we also have lethal and sublethal, meaning those changes that happen in our DNA can be lethal, can be detrimental to our survival. There are a few examples, categories of information that you may come across here related to lethal and sublethal uh, genes. Okay, that is also need to be covered in 9.2. So once you figure out these, and then in 9.3, we talk about concept of genetic polymorphism. Okay, this is not the order that is actually logical. But first of all, we focus on understanding how are the units organized, what is the scope of each of these units, and then I'll tell you what is the order that I prefer in understanding the concepts in logical man. So 9.3, concept of genetic polymorphism. Poly means many, morphs means forms. So here we talked about we have genes, we have DNA, but some characteristics at the level of either DNA, at the level of protein, or at the level of appearance. They may show variation. So that is what is polymorphism talks about. Okay. So and selection. Mendelian populations and Hardy-Winn bug law. This is the most important one here. This again connects us to evolutionary part. So Hardy-Winn bug law is, is a law that is given to understand that in absence of several factors, can evolution take place? Can variation take place in our DNA? Okay. So this law, we have to understand what is Hardy-Winn bug law? What does it talk about? and what factors influence these frequencies of our genes and our DNA in the body. Okay, allelic frequency, gene frequencies, genotype frequencies we talk about. So basically variations in the amount of, certain amount of sequences in a given population and what's influencing them. So factors like, you know, mutation that can change DNA, isolation, migration, 
selection and inbreeding, genetic drift. These are all the various components which are again usually asked in the exams. And as I was telling you, this connects you to back to the evolution. In what sense? Because here, uh, we, we talk about the role of various aspects in shaping the evolution. Okay, in absence of those factors, hard day win bugla holds true. Okay, this also has an application. When you have these changes happening, you can figure out what factor changing what. And you can predict in future generations what's going to happen. Is the disease going to increase or decrease? based on the nature of the genes they are single factor multi-factor and using these te techniques you can figure that out and some amount of prediction can be done as well okay that is what we do so here you're not studying at the individual level here you're studying at the level of a population that is why it is 9.3 can be considered as population genetics as well okay because here your focus is bigger bigger group Right, so then we have some miscellaneous things, consanguineous marriages, non-consanguineous marriages, meaning cousin marriages, blood-related marriages that happen. What are, the, what are the impacts of that on disease rate, genetic disease rate in a given population? And then what is the load that we experience because of, because of inbreeding? So marrying within the related species. So what happens, what amount of load, meaning, what amount of effect it will have on the fitness of that group. Okay, this is called genetic load and the various factors uh, influenced, not various factors, sorry. So effect of consanguineous marriages or cousin marriages on these components are discussed here. So you see it here. Here we study the population by taking hard day winberg law as a common theme here. And then eventually you move on to understanding the factors influencing hard day winberg law and what happens when little marriages happen and so on. Okay, so that is about the population genetics and then you come to 9.4. So this is studying the defects in chromosomes and what type of problems these defects cause. Okay, little bit complex in terms of, you know, uh, terminology and the process, but still doable topic uh, and good amount of information, good amount of uh, diagrams are available. So with little effort, you can easily understand this. <clears throat> so yeah, basically, uh, what changes are happening in our chromosomes? Number changes. Sometimes we don't have 46 chromosomes, but we may have 47, or we may have 45, one more or one less. So why do they happen? Okay, there are examples of diseases. We talk about Klinfelter's, super females, Turner's. These are all different genetic disease conditions or chromosomal abnormalities caused because of number changes in chromosomes. Similarly, we also have structural abnormalities. So here, change happens in the structure of the chromosome. Maybe a portion gets deleted, maybe a portion gets added, maybe you know they are reverted. So these type of changes happen. Sometimes they also ask this question, I think once. Most commonly, they're asking questions on this numerical abnormalities. Sometimes they're even picking up Klinfelter's. Klinfelter's syndrome, Down syndrome, short notes are coming on this. Okay? So we have to understand here the numerical and the structural abnormalities and there are enough examples. Many of these like Down syndrome, Patau syndrome, Edward syndromes, these are also numerical abnormalities. Kaidu chart syndrome is the structural abnormality. So when you read this, here they ask in a general sense, these examples are of use. Okay, once you finish talking about uh, abnormalities in chromosomes, either in number or in the structure, next what do you do? You study about these miscellaneous topics as part of 9.4D, where genetic imprints, imprinting is also one such scenario where diseases are possible. So what is imprinting? And once you study about the causes and reasons behind these genetic diseases, we learn about screening. How to screen for these genetic abnormalities. Again, it cuts, connects us back to the 9.1, where we talked about cytogenetic analysis, the carotoping analysis and uh, DNA technology like uh, DNA fingerprinting. So those gives us some insight into what's causing what. So this can be seen as diagnostics, so which is part of screening. And then some amount of counseling is needed because the genetics is not easy for understanding for some people, right? You have to counsel them. You have to tell them if you marry like this within the family, what happens? And if you have these defective genes in your DNA, in your body, what is the chance that your children may get it? If they get it, what is the chance of their survival? 
So those things have to be done through counseling. That is called genetic counseling. And then human DNA profiling, I already mentioned to you, this is nothing but DNA fingerprinting. So by looking into the patterns of DNA, this can be used as a diagnostic tool. Here we talk about DNA fingerprinting principle process and how it is useful. Okay, then gene mapping, genomic studies. So gene mapping, this is nothing but studying the uh, positioning the genes on our DNA, our chromosomes. What techniques or tools are used for it? What are their uses? What are the shortcomings of it? Whenever you're studying about the methods, you have to focus on this. What is the principle? How are these methods done? What are the issues or limitations of those methods? Okay, then genomic studies. Genomic studies nowadays, I think, picking up quite a bit because uh, after Human Genome Project, uh, in India, more recently, we have seen surge in the studies related to human, human genetic analysis. Nowadays, COVID-19, if you see DNA sequencing of COVID-19, how is that useful to us? What is the benefit of sequencing it? Is it really guiding us towards vaccine development, diagnostic, uh, in developing diagnostics? So those are the things that we have to study, study here. What are genomic studies, how do they work, and uh, what type of benefits they provide? Then moving on to the 9.5, this is again a core idea in anthropology, which is concept of race and racism. So here we study about, do races actually exist? What is a biological basis for classifying people into various subcategories of species or races? Okay, so racial criteria, there's a lot of overlapping topics here. And uh, what is the influence of hereditary, meaning genes? and environment on these traits. Meaning, do they change because of the environment? Do they change because of the genetic components? What plays major role? And then we have some subtopics or miscellaneous topics like race crossing in man. Did races actually stayed pure or was there an amalgamation or crossing that happened among them? Okay, so this is about concept of race and racism. There are frequently they asked about uh, discussing on the debate of race concept. Does it really exist? If it exists, does it exist in the social con context or does it exist in the biological context? What is a new idea of race? Okay, so this is something that is fo fo you can follow. Some amount of uh, terminology problems will be there because there, uh, here, there you discuss mostly about the concepts of you know, uh, skeletal systems, changes, certain features, eye structure, how it is different in uh, some races. Okay, So those concepts require some understanding, but it overlaps with the fossils. Some amount of knowledge you will gain from that, like prognathism, why we have protruding phases, why some races have protruding phases. So those concepts. Okay? The terminology will be useful for this as well as for the fossils. Then we'll come to the 9.6. 9.6 is, in a way, is connected to the polymorphism. Here we talk about what is called markers, genetic markers. Those molecules that can be used in understanding or classifying people. Here the idea is not to classify humans, but using those variations for understanding the diseases or you know, for certain applications that I'm going to mention to you. So here you study about those things that vary in humans. Like we have different blood groups. So we talk about your blood groups. We talk about some markers which are called HLA markers, human leukocyte antigen, or we have something called transferrin. Trans, transferrin. So this is the complex part of unit 9.6. This first part is complex. There is some shortage of actual material. I know there are very few limited sources that people follow. Um, that where I have done some work to add uh, weightage or you know uh, what do you normally say weightage or, or value addition. I have done for this part. So complexity here lies in knowing the molecules, how much variation that you see in the population, where is it useful to us? How is ABO blood groups are useful? Okay, can they be used in paternity disputes? Can they actually identify who is a biological father? What is the limitation of it? How much can we know from ABO blood groups? Why are they considered to be very good genetic markers? Okay, those type of questions are usually coming in the exam. So understanding those concepts are important. There are a couple of enzymes and a couple of protein molecules that you have to know here. Okay, second part is easier. It is mostly like variation in physiological aspects, like you know hemoglobin level in the body, body fat, how respiratory functions, 
pulse varies in people how people people's you know sensory perceptions smelling abilities vary in different cultural and socio economic groups so this connects biological anthropology to the social anthropology how culture influences what wherever possible in all these units we have to see this in the social and cultural context as well okay so this is about 9.6 and then comes two units that is 9.7 and 9.8 so 9.7 deals with ecological anthropology so as i was briefly mentioning to you before here we talk about adaptations human adaptations how humans who live in different environmental conditions like you know desert areas in desert areas you know how do they adjust to that what type of changes happen in them same thing if people are living in you know colder climates towards the poles what type of changes happen in them and people who live in higher altitudes mountain regions what type of changes happen in them so because of the curiosity of human mind they wanted to know in the biological context what changes have happened why some people could actually happily survive there where it is considered to be a problem in other regions okay so those aspects not too difficult at all both in cultural biological aspects we study here about how people how humans adapted to this okay easier chapter and then epidemiological anthropology is very very relevant in current scenario here we study about health and disease okay so infectious problems in humans that lead to human death human population variation and non infectious diseases those that don't spread which is very very important because these days we see a trend where lesser and lesser infectious problems are seen more and more non communicable or non infectious problems are seen yes they are still evident we still have enough infectious diseases but there is a slight shift towards non infectious diseases there was a big study that had been released in 2018 that talks about indian scenario on this which had been asked in the exam before okay so here we are looking into the disease and how disease can influence human development how it has influenced in the past which can be connected to the tribal regions as well recent times we have seen that in andamanis they have reported covid 19 right what kind of impact it can have on that these type of questions are very much possible given the new changes the pandemic that we are seeing in the world now okay similarly various factors nutritional deficiencies in people what type of diseases they can lead to what type of cultural approaches people take uh, in to deal with the problems in the absence of knowledge of science okay and uh, those things that you study in epidemiological anthropology not too complex so it is anyway you study as part of your uh, uh, general studies for upsc prelims part some amount overlap is seen here so this is all about the human genetics part human genetics and there are different dimensions that we have seen as part of unit 9 okay right next unit 10 deals with the human growth and development so here we again talk about some core biological concepts that is what are the different growth stages that we go through in in our life of you know once we are born what stages what specific features that we go through here and then once we see various stages in human growth and development we talk about factors this is very important again in the context of anthropology how our genes uh you know influence us in terms of our height in terms of our disease resistance right in terms of aging process and how environment can influence us how biochemical components like maybe pesticides maybe in you know sorry, not pesticides yes right chemical components there yeah. many biochemical components protein production rate of production antibody production can influence us nutritional components very clear we probably all know it like taking a proper amount of diet how does it influence growth and cultural socio economic factors how do they influence human growth and development okay these are the things that we study as part of unit 10 so basically idea is understanding the growth aspects biological as well as the factors that influence them. then once you understand these factors you all uh, will realize that aging is a common phenomenon so because the growth and development doesn't happen forever it stops at one point of time it indeed goes down leading to aging right aging and senescence overlapping concepts okay this is where some students have some confusion where the senescence leads to aging or aging leads to senescence and i have seen that sometimes people when they don't have good understanding on this they mix both there is overlap there is no doubt about it but what leads to that so basically senescence is a cellular level process that leads to aging there are theories what people have thought about like why do we age 
right? Is there any benefit of aging? Okay, there are some theories, biological theories as well as social theories of aging that we have to study. Okay, and then there are other parts like uh, what is the biological age and chronological age? Is there a difference? How do we know the difference? How do we measure it? So meaning what we see outside and what is inside, is there a difference? And also we have a concept called somatotyping. Nothing but classifying, typing means classifying people based on their appearance. Okay, this is one concept uh, that had been developed from the field of psychology and then even studied as part of anthropology. Okay, this is, uh, these questions are usually coming, aging, theories of aging, biological, chronological, longevity or uh, age, somatotyping, and even methodologies of growth studies. How growth studies are performed. There are different types of studies which are asked and what are the shortcomings of these growth studies are also asked in the exams before. Lot of questions appear from the unit 10. Okay, very core again. Concept, doable, not too difficult. Okay, and very interesting because we learn about something that we are all going through. Then uh, 11 is more or less connected to the growth, but this is mostly focusing on the concept of fertility and fecundity with the major focus on women's uh, reproductive life. Okay, menarche, menopause, what are the different events that take place in them, which define their reproductive life, and what are the patterns and differentials that you see, you know, in various populations. And also, if you see towards 11.3, even factors, what factors influence them? Okay, various socio-ecological factors, so biological factors, social factors, cultural factors, how do they influence them? Not only fertility, fecundity, but also natality. So birth rate and mortality, that is death rate. Okay, these things are studied. Along with that, we also study demographic theories. So demography, so biologically, socially, culturally, variation in the population structure that happens. So that is what you study in level, not too complex. Okay, so this unit 11, except for uh, idea of uh, fertility, remaining concepts are easy. You can easily follow it just need a logic okay and uh, then comes the last part of uh, physical anthropology which is unit 12 which is applications of anthropology some overlap with the other topics here but here focus is how do we use this okay so for example we have anthropology in sports nutritional anthropology here we talk about what is called anthropometry meaning measuring various components of human body Okay, so nutritional anthropology, sports, and also we have uh, for designing defense equipment and other equipments and forensic anthropology is part. <coughs> Excuse me. For all of them, the common theme here is measurements. So here we talk about the, as I was telling, anthropometry. We have some concepts called anthroposcopy, anthropometry. So those methods, which are also, which you come across in somatotyping as well, are a few use here. Like basically telling how well you can perform based on your appearance by taking some measurements. And how do you understand the nutritional deficiencies by taking measurements? Again, anthropometry used in that. So this is like utilizing anthropometry in various aspects. Designing various equipment, whether this shield fits to your head or not, whether you can sit the cockpit, what is the average size of people who are using the cockpit, okay? So for that, designing equipment, we also need the understanding about human dimensions okay anthropometry is very important here then a very very important aspect here is forensic anthropology how understanding of humans human fossils human uh, various skeletal uh, measures and dna fingerprinting those aspects how is it used in dealing with crimes in solving crimes this is where forensic anthropology comes where personal identification reconstructing the evidences basically in terms of uh, human uh, structure okay uh, these things are done here. Questions are frequently asked on these are the short notes, okay, are, are in, the in the context of applications of anthropology as such. Then applied human genetics, again connected to uh, the topics that we already studied in unit uh, 9.1, 9.4. So here, paternity diagnosis. How can you solve the disputes of paternity? DNA fingerprinting, blood groups, how are they useful? And genetic counseling, repetition, but we already talked about that. And eugenics is one concept that you study here, is a phenomena that evolved, you know, a few decades ago. What is that concept? Short note uh, appears here. And DNA technology in diseases and medicine, something that we might have already studied in 9.1. And serogenetics and cytogenetics. Again, cytogenetics part we have studied, but in reproductive biology, what is the connection? 
one area where we don't have too much of information there is a small little amount of information that people refer from pinat okay that is replicated in many books okay so that is something that uh, we study also this is about the brief overview on syllabus uh, of uh, physical anthropology part hope this gives you a good understanding on this now i would like to tell you what order we should follow to understand this okay uh, i as i was telling you i would begin with evolutionary component understanding human evolution and uh, it's up to you whether you want to start with primates and finish fossils but if you feel fossils is a little too much to begin with then you can study this later but finish 1.4 first then get the basics figured out from unit 1.7 okay and then don't move to the 9.1 but talk about study about mendelian genetics why because principles are first important once you understand how inheritance happens in us then using the methods in understanding that makes sense so understand the genetic inheritance principles first so read 9.2 and then you can actually move to the 9.4 because you already understood in 1.8 and 1.7 chromosome structure here you study the abnormalities in chromosomes okay then move on to the 9.1 where you study the use of methods either it is cytogenetic methods pedigree analysis okay and in in basically uh, analyzing the problems diagnosing the problems okay so then it makes sense so go with the 9.1 after that right and then what else we have once you do that then move on to the population genetics okay i would do population genetics here like 9.3 and then markers because once you understand the population genetics polymorphism once you understand what are those molecules that differ in populations and what are their uses so 9.6 can be covered after genetic polymorphism on 9.3 you club it like that becomes easy and uh, it will make a more logical transition from one unit to the other okay then race and racism can be studied separately individually if you study race and racism you will be introduced few concepts of uh, terms that you need in the fossils as well and then ecological epidemiological anthropology you can study in whenever not too difficult to understand and then 10 11 12 are also separate well you can do in the end once you have you know better understanding about the principles and then applications will be easy okay this is what i recommend you to do and uh, next what type of sources what type of books people actually read uh, as i was telling you there are many blogs written by students and many institutions already have put the list of books so many people are uh, aware about the books so for physical anthropology uh, i think more or less unanimously people say that pinath is the go to book and then uh, brain tree material there are some other institutions material but one thing i would like to add here being a specialist in this field being myself who got education in genetics and ha having gone through books like pinath in my own life during my education <clears throat> those books are good they define the boundaries very well but they they are not the books for us to uh, actually get the interest gain the interest in read and understand why because they are dry and people where we talk about factual data and if you cannot make connections they are little boring so i would not recommend you to wholly re uh, rely on pina by the pina book there are some topics where they are easily available in pina than the other sources you do that but definitely for gaining more insight so that you can actually analyze so that your answer stands out so that you can get more than 320 330 marks score there you need to have have to add some value addition to that for that you can actually use you know there are some good resources and books like for example stain and roof is a good book written for physical anthropology you don't have to read everything in that the topics that are relevant to us to the syllabus like fossils neatly given with great amount of images with nice comparisons read them okay that will give you a good insight and also will help you to structure your answer okay they develop they may take there are more pages there but in the process of reading you will make the connections and you will remember you can retrieve the information better i would highly recommend for you to actually use these type of sources in our courses what do you do i actually selected uh, units we we <clears throat> so scan it so not scan it we actually xerox it and make copies and give it to students selected units okay not everything <clears throat> and then what type of sources so i believe that when you connect the standard references and when you go through uh, the syllabus and understand the scope of the topic which we have done and work on your concepts make sure to definitely have your own notes made 
right? Doesn't matter. Whoever notes, whether you have, you know, ranker one, ranker two, ranker three, notes are available with you, they are their own notes. It will be difficult for you to revise that from someone else's notes. So once you have collection of content with you, make your own notes, even if structure okay, is important. Once you go through the first reading, you have to go again over the information that you have collected, you have written, second reading essential. This is where you find the gaps in your understanding. <clears throat> to me, this is where you actually start understanding the things. The first time you try to understand, you have some sense of information, you collected the data, but actual thinking process only begins when you're starting to read it again. Fill those gaps, add more information, you know, collect case studies. This is very, very important. Relevant examples, relevant case studies are very, very important. The type of books I talk to you, they give relevant case studies. Okay, that is one of the big use of them. And for presenting information better, you have to develop diagrams and flowcharts. Especially for the fossils part, drawing this, skeletal system, drawing the bone, even rough diagram of it, being able to show clearly the difference between, let's say, two different species, or primates and humans, oh, sorry. or uh, like a gorilla, for example, or chimpanzees and humans, skeletal comparison. You should be able to practice, you should be able to draw the diagrams with good practice. Those improvisation you have to do during the second reading, make flow charts, and make sure that presentation of your information is logical. And I believe, presentation can only reach to that level when you have good understanding and just by reading few things and mugging a few things that won't happen put little extra effort to get this because optional is a deciding factor and physical anthropology is something that where you can score more in the anthropology part itself why because factual data is there information is more or less fixed there's higher uh, so higher chances of you know scoring more so make use of it okay and then of course nothing can replace practicing. Practicing, practice answer writing. Now, how much ever you know, doesn't matter. You put it on the paper, let, give it to someone, either you join a test series program or you have seniors, someone who can look into it. Nowadays we have telegram channels and people read it and give you an opinion on how does it sound, what elements are missing. So that is where you actually trying to put the information you read and you grasped into the form that examiner can understand. Okay, these are the various aspects that you have to go through in your preparation and to add value to it. What I recommend, yes, where there are a few things, few things have added because a lot of the material that we see in the market is, uh, is outdated. Okay, of course, many of those things hold true. Evolutionary concepts have not changed, but to add the value to it, pick up few studies that have happened in these areas, which is possible only when you understand the concepts, right? Like, for example, this work that had been published in uh, few years ago uh, by a scientist who study epidemiological anthropology. Adaptation to high altitude. What are the phenotypic changes and genotypes that you see in it? Okay, brief summary of that. And then uh, newspapers like Bradford study finds higher birth defect risk in married cousins. Where is it connected? It is connected to the consanguineous marriages, right? Cousin marriages, where in UK study had been done, the where they found out that they, where they analyzed 11,300 babies and uh, one third of the babies have some abnormalities. So how cousin marriages, inbreeding is leading to problems. So cite these type of studies. Okay. So this is how you have to add the value, which happens only after understanding the scope content. Okay. But there's a lot of sources, a lot of information. If you can digest to add the value. But yes, one thing I recommend, don't give it, go with too many sources. Go with some core books. Okay. Follow them, make your notes and add case studies and examples. Okay, this is what I highly recommend you to do. I hope this uh, video is informative to you. Okay, so if you have any questions, so you can go to our Fenman IAS website and we have our contact information is there. We have a telegram groups there. You can join there and collect the information and plan your preparation there. Okay, all the very best to you. Hope this is uh, very informative to you to understand. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them and post them uh, in, in, through our website or through our phone number. Right? Thank you very much, everyone. All the best.